Good morning to our church family on this civic holiday weekend. I'm Tim Bruno, the minister at St. Giles Kingsway, and I'm glad to be welcoming you to worship on this day. Many of you have participated in the worship gatherings during the week in the courtyard. It's a great way to be with others and to worship our God and share our faith and friendship together. There will be a gathering again this week, hopefully in the courtyard, weather depending, on Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. Pastor Stephen Yoon will be leading that gathering as I'm going on holiday this week. You are very welcome to attend. For the attentive St. Giles Kingsway video worshiper, you may notice something very familiar about today's worship service. Besides my opening words, we're making use of one of our summer worship services from last year. Due to some challenges at putting together the service, our team found this to be a good option on this day. So this worship service is from Sunday, August 16th, 2020, with the Reverend Clyde Irvine preaching on the topic of getting beyond greed. We're grateful for Clyde's leadership here as the lead minister at St. Giles Kingsway in the 1990s and as a guest on occasion on anniversaries or special worship services over the years. So we welcome Clyde back to the pulpit in this way on this Sunday. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us begin worship with an opening prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, You grant us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that we might celebrate your goodness and grace, that we might worship you in unity of spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Holy, almighty, merciful Father, We have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires of our own hearts and turned away from your guiding hand. We have gone against your holy teaching in the scripture. We have left undone things which we ought to have done, and we have done many things which we ought not to have done. Loving God, have mercy upon us. Spare those and confess their faults who come to you with humble and repentant hearts. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, merciful God, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name and the blessing of all people. Forgive us, God. Mend what is broken. Heal the wounded relationships that separate us from you and divide nation against nation. We pray this prayer in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, the assurance of forgiveness comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 1. We hear, To all who received him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Friends, as we put our trust and hope in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Let us join together with our St. Giles Kingsway praise team as they lead the way in worship. Good morning, friends. Well, this morning, I'd like to help 
to answer one of the questions raised by skeptics, especially the youth in today's world. Oftentimes they ask me, so Stephen, are you a Christian? And I say, of course I am. And then they will say, so you really believe in the virgin birth, do you? And I say, yeah, of course I do. It's real. It happened. And then they hesitate for a while and they will scratch their head and they say, you know what? That's why I don't like Christianity. Why? Because for me, Christianity is all about blind faith. There's no evidence. There's no reason. It's all about just faith in the faith. So I said, okay, that's fine. And then I would change the topic around and I say, do you believe in the theory of Big Bang? Do you? And they say, yeah, of course. Scientists agree that there was a point where this universe did not exist. And then at some point, this universe began to exist. And I would just follow their logic and say, you know what? Anything that begins to exist must have a cause. And when we look at this universe, it seems that this cause must be very powerful, very intelligent, and very personal because he chose to create something. He didn't have to. And fourth, I say, this person, this being must be very beautiful because when we look at the creation, when we look at the trees, the birds, and the flowers, they're so small and yet they're so complicated and there's a beauty within it. And I tell them, you know what it is? According to the observation, it seems that it is more plausible to believe in a God who created this world out of nothing than to believe that this universe came out of nothing. To believe that this universe began to exist out of nothing, it's like saying, imagine a tornado going through a junkyard and at the end of tornado, you have Boeing 777. Can you believe that? A Boeing, a complicated, complex, designed, purposeful, intelligent design came just because a tornado went through a junkyard. That's, it, that's what it is to have a faith of the atheist. So my friends, I tell them, you know what it is? I simply do not have the faith to be an atheist. And I think there are many times where atheists actually have greater faith than Christians. So you know what? In, time, in speaking of who has the blind faith, I don't think it is Christians. In fact, it is more plausible to believe in a creator rather than to say that this universe came out of nothing. How about you? Have you examined your faith? Have you examined why you believe in what you believe? If you haven't, well, let us examine why we believe in what we believe. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Give us, give us faith to trust you and to follow you through the difficult times. At the same time, Lord, help us to understand what it means to believe in you. Help us to understand why we believe in what we believe. Oh Lord, have mercy on us and strengthen our faith with reason and with evidence as well so that we may defend our faith. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Get us up and send us up, Lord. 
Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, reading verses 13 to 21, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said, replied, man, who appointed me as judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a, cer of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will, you, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it is with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The famous Russian author Leo Tolstoy tells a story about a peasant Russian called Pahom, who was very eager to buy land. On being told that there was cheap land for sale in the faraway Russian district of the Bashkirs, Pahom decided to go there. And when he got there, the Bashkirs offered him a proposal. They said, we sell land by the day. So as much as you can walk around in a day, that will be yours to claim. And the price will be 1,000 rubles a day. But there's one condition. If you don't return before sunset to the very spot from where you started, your money will be lost. Well, Pahom set out at sunrise the next day to stake out his land, dreaming already of the oxen he'd buy and the people he'd hire to do the ploughing. As the day went on, he knew that he should be heading home, or heading back at least, but then he'd see another piece of land that he wanted, too beautiful to give up. However, eventually, Pahom's body began to give up as the day wore on. Finally, throwing aside his belongings, he started to run back toward where he'd come, his heart beating faster and faster. And as the sun was sinking in the sky, he discovered that he was within sight of his starting place. On seeing him, the Baskers cheered him on until finally he arrived back at the very spot from which he'd begun. And one of them said, that's a fine fellow. He's gained much land today. And right there, Pahom dropped dead. The topic of today's sermon, as you may have guessed by now, is greed. Well, that lets me off the hook, you may say to yourself. I'm not wealthy enough to be greedy. But the truth is that greed isn't about how much we have. It's about how much we still want and about never being satisfied with what we've got. And so greed affects all of us, whether we have lots or whether we have little. I'll go further and say that greed is such a pervasive feature of our society that it's now considered normal. 
Greed has become socially acceptable. Indeed, consumerism depends on our greed. And to that end, advertising relentlessly tries to persuade us that not only do we need more, but that we deserve more and we have the right to more. Because greed is pervasive and acceptable, it's very much part and parcel of the air we breathe. Those who manage to avoid paying taxes by taking their money out of the country, those who maximize their profits by paying employees a minimum wage with no benefits, those who sell goods at an exorbitant markup price, those who win the lottery at the expense of others. We don't call any of those people greedy, we call them a success. It's not an exaggeration to say that greed, the insatiable desire for more, has simply become a way of life. Quite a number of decades ago, I can remember as a boy sharing a wardrobe with my two older brothers. My section of the wardrobe contained, oh, I don't know, perhaps two or three gray shirts for school, a white shirt for Sunday, and several multicolored ones for summertime. Beside them hung my good pair of trousers for Sunday. My school trousers probably had me downs for my brothers. And next to them, my best flannels. It didn't take a lot of space back then to house my clothes. And yet today, I have one closet with perhaps 50 shirts in it, another closet with at least two dozen pairs of trousers hanging inside, and I ask myself, why? But greed isn't just an individual issue, it's also a social issue. To maximize profits, there are some entrepreneurs who take shortcuts that compromise safety, that compromise quality, that compromise the environment. To maximize wages, some unions will demand such fat contracts that they end up making the firm financially unviable. The truth is that all of us, whether we call ourselves Christians or not, greedily cling to and then want to add more to what we've already got making us at the same time unwilling to share what we have with those who have nothing. Quite simply, greed has us in its grip. And the consequences, especially for the have-nots of this world, can be deadly. To illustrate the grip that greed has on us, Luke's Gospel reports an incident from the ministry of Jesus, how an anonymous person in the crowd listening to Jesus interrupted him to demand that he help him with a problem. And this was his problem. He said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Apparently, squabbles about wills were as common back then as they are now. And because wills are sometimes written up and their proceeds sometimes distributed in unfair ways, this particular person who interrupted Jesus may well have had a legitimate point. And yet, Jesus refused to arbitrate. And his refusal was based on this. Greed. The person who asked Jesus to arbitrate, arbitrate was preoccupied by wanting more. He wanted more money from the family estate. His mind was on one thing only, on what he hoped to soon possess. A mother was once driving her five-year-old son 
to McDonald's. And on the way, they passed a car accident quite close to the restaurant. At that point, the mother suggested to her five-year-old son in the back seat that he ought to pray for those who may have been hurt in the accident. This, however, is the prayer she heard coming from the back seat. Please, God, don't let any cars block the way to McDonald's. The child, the child, like the person who interrupted Jesus, had his mind on only one thing, what he hoped to soon possess. We're all rather like that. Dissatisfied with what we have, we want more. It's a state of mind that caused Jesus here in Luke chapter 12 to warn us. And his warning is a warning. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, said Jesus, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. We've all heard that warning all of our life. And yet we find it hard, I think, to fight the desire for more and more. Deep down, of course, we know that money, while necessary, comes and goes. Deep down, we know that we have a house that provides shelter and comfort, and that it's only bricks and mortar. Deep down, we know that our job may well satisfy us and help others, but that it will one day end. And yet we keep believing, believing the lie that what we own will secure our future. No, said Jesus, no. Your life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. And at that point, Jesus told a parable about a wealthy farmer who had so much, such a great harvest, that he didn't know what to do with it. What should I do? The harvest said to himself. What shall I do with all the things that I've got? Notice the I, me, my, mine. What shall I do? I'll pull down my barns, he said. I'll build larger barns for myself. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Quite frankly, the farmer was absorbed by his possessions. He lived under the illusion that his possessions could secure his future for years and years and years. And then in his parable, Jesus used this rather shocking sentence. For in the parable, God says to the man, you fool. This very night, your life is being demanded of you. And your bigger barns to house all your possessions, whose will they be? Many of us heard this parable when we were kids in Sunday school. And yet we still cling to the notion that what we own can secure our future. It's not true, said Jesus. Life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. They secure nothing. When illness comes, or death stares us in the face, all the things that we've accumulated won't matter one bit. Jesus' parable sounds harsh, I admit that. But the reason for Jesus' harshness is surely this, that possessions have a way of deceiving us, so that we waste far too much time and effort acquiring them, 
Greed blinds us to the things that really do matter. So what are we to do about greed? A sin that has the power to kill both our relationship with God as well as our relationship with our neighbor. Well, the first thing we can do is to acknowledge just how strong a temptation greed is in our lives. We often like to think that greed is somebody else's problem, but it's our problem. It's our problem. And it's our problem if it prevents us from living freely, from living generously, from giving to meet the needs of others, including the support of the church. The second thing we can do about greed is expose its illusion. One mother once told me that she regularly would sit with her children as they watched television, pointing out to them how ridiculous and how devious and how exaggerated the advertisements on television truly are. She felt that this deconstruction work was one of her more important parenting tasks. And she, of course, was right. It doesn't matter how many bars of Irish Spring soap I use, I'll still be me. And if I salivate over the thought of owning a new Lexus and exhaust my line of cr credit trying to pay for the thing, that purchase will not add one day to my life. The Bible, in fact, tells me that the Lexus that I'd like to have will one day be a pile of rust. And all the clothes and shirts and ties and trousers hanging in my closet will one day provide lunch for a bunch of moths. But having identified the tempting power of greed and exposed its illusions, we then must do one more thing. And that third thing is this, we need to trust God. We need to trust God. If you, if you think about it, greed is ultimately fueled by fear. Greed is fueled by fear of the future. And our insecurity about not having enough for the future, as if more possessions could guarantee the future, but they cannot. After the moths and the rust have done their worst, only God finally remains. And we need to trust him. The English hymn writer Henry Francis Light in a rather solemn mood once composed these words. He wrote, Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. When you're fearful about the future, trust God, not money. When your heart is breaking, trust God, not another trip to them all. When trouble darkens your day, trust God, not your credit card. When someone treats you as an insignificant nobody, trust God, not your acquisitions. And when you enter the valley of the shadow of death, trust God. Trust God to love you and to provide for you not only for this life, but for the life to come. Not only will such trust in the loving and faithful God break greed's power, it will free you to become generous 
as you live your life. Trust God. Trust the God whom Jesus revealed. And you will learn to give away not only your life, but your resources too. And to find great joy in doing so. Your life is precious to God. He can secure it. Not any amount of possessions you will ever have. Trust God. Amen. in the prayers of the people. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us with your word this day. We are grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints. We offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice and inhumanity and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. Particularly, with borders closed during this global pandemic, we pray for refugees who have been trapped in unwelcoming destinations and in less than adequate situations. O Lord of Providence, holding the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country that you continue to give meaning to the principles of peace, order, and good government upon which our confederation is built. Inspire the hearts and minds of our civic, judicial, and pol political leaders that they together with all our nation may first seek your kingdom and righteousness so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. O oh God the Creator, we pray for all nations and peoples. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your children. Especially keep Beirut and all of Lebanon in your heart as they strive to recover from de devastation and corruption. We pray for a just solution for the people of Belarus as they protest against a disputed election. And we wish for free and fair elections in all democracies. O oh, Saviour God, look upon your church in its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on its weakness, bring to an end its unhappy divisions, and scatter its fear. O oh, look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase its courage, strength, and its faith, and inspire its witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, and our only Savior. Amen. As our worship ends, 
I want to give you this blessing, not so much from me as from God, the God who said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.